people select unconsciously the best stride frequency for them. So you can change that with training. You can change that doing running technique exercises. But if you try to change your running cadence consciously, your running economy will will be worse. So your performance will be worse. Any change in your biomechanics has to be unconscious. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for being here with me for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by runnersconnect.net. So last week we heard the real story of the passing of Ryan Shea from his wife, Alicia Shea. She told us about how broken she was after it happened and how she used running to try and hide from her grief. But if you didn't listen yet, I'm sure you can already guess where this is going. And yeah, it did catch up to her and she paid the price with four years of setback in her running. So if you missed that one, make sure you go back and check it out. So today we're going to move on away from the emotional stuff and move towards the science. I first heard of this researcher when I read an article from Alex Hutchinson, who you might remember from episode 52. Alex is one of those people you know you can trust with sharing valuable information. And so I started digging deeper into Dr. Santos and I found he'd published a lot of studies and they were absolutely fascinating. But I didn't want to keep it to myself. So I just hoped he would respond to my request to come on the podcast. And thankfully he did. So this episode is going to blow your mind. There is so much good stuff in here and so many things that left my ground on the floor because I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. If you love the science behind running or you love to do what you can to be the best you can be, this episode is just going to be packed with so much good stuff and will probably become one of your favorites. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this episode and I hope you're enjoying some time with family and friends over the next week. This is truly the time of year to cherish with those we love. And I just want to take this moment to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for spending time with me every week. So let's get on with the interview. This podcast is brought to you by Saucony. For those of you who have not heard of this brand, they're the best, really. I don't just wear Saucony for every run, but they also have a great collection of casual clothes for everyday use, which I live in. Use coupon code TINA for 10% off your next order. Running is tiring, we know that, but the accumulation of miles is what really gets us, leaving us sore and exhausted. I take Body Health Perfect Amino Tablets to improve recovery, and you should too. You will notice a difference, and you can learn more at bodyhealth.com. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Jordan. Thank you for hosting me. I am ex- excited to host you, and... Um, yeah, before we kind of get into the the real meat of this episode, getting into what you've done, your work, which I'm sure a lot of our runners will be excited to hear about because they love the science behind things. Um, you did start out initially um, as a as a pretty damn good runner yourself. Um, you had your own international running career, so maybe tell us a bit about you know where you're from, what, how your running career started, and um, what you were able to achieve. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, I started running. From a very young age, I started when I was 13, and I was uh, quite a sporty guy before that, but I only started when I was 13 because my father made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. He told me, basically, if you want an air rifle for your birthday, you have to start running. (laughs) He bribed you. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So I wasn't very good at the beginning, but I, uh, I have been always a really hard working guy. So slowly, slowly, my performance improved. Um, By the time I was like 20 years old, something like that, I was a pretty decent runner. And as you say, I I reached the final, for example, at the European Championships in Hungary, in Debrecen. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, I... Which event was that? The 1500. I I was a middle distance runner. Even if I have done like cross country, like 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters, all these events, my my best events were middle distance ones. 
-hmm. So more or less, that's how everything started. Mm -hmm. And you said that your dad kind of uh, gave you that that air rifle as the kind of bribe, essentially, to start running. But was your dad a runner? Did he enjoy running himself? Was that why he wanted you to get into it? Uh, Exactly, exactly. He was a runner when he was younger, so he wanted me to do the same. Mm. And you said that, um, you know, it was it was a lot of hard work that you um, that kind of got you there. So what is there anything that you would like to say to people listening who kind of, um, you know, feel like they don't have that much talent, but, you know, you know that they could if they work really hard and, you know, really focus, they can get to where they want to go. Do you have any advice for people? Well, training hard is important, but actually it's more important to get enough rest if you are training hard. So a lot of people actually train really, really hard, but they don't sleep enough. And that's why they don't improve. So I will say, yeah, training hard is important, but it's more important to train smart Mm -hmm. and to sleep well, have a good diet and stuff. But actually, even people that think that they are not talented can achieve really, really good performances if they do everything right. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Very, very helpful. And um, so for you being um, an international runner, what was the highlight of your running career? I would say that maybe when I broke the eight minutes barrier for the 3000 meters indoors, mm-hmm. I ran in seven minutes, 59 seconds in Sevilla in 2011. It was great. Actually, I think that it was impossible a few years ago, but I don't know how I managed to, to get that performance done. And also when I reached the final at the European Championships, I was the seventh in that race. It was great. Or when I got the silver medal at the Spanish Championships for the under-23 category. Great. And well done for those. Very, very good work. And uh, proof that, like you said, hard work is part of it, but a bigger part of it is rest. And um, just one more thing before we kind of dive into your professional career. Um, how long did it take you to kind of figure that out with the rest and the eating right and the other parts of running that aren't the working hard part? Did you learn it when you were studying or before? Actually, unfortunately, I learned everything after I re- after my retirement mm-hmm. because okay. um, I was training very hard, but I was not resting enough because I was doing my PhD and you know studying, working and stuff. So actually, I think that my performance will have been better. Mm -hmm. I have rested more, slept more, and on all these things. Okay, so you can be reflective here, and we can all kind of jump ahead and listen to you now so we can make that uh, change before we uh, do decide to kind of retire from running. So when did you decide to retire from running? Was it something that you kind of had achieved what you wanted to achieve in running, or were you still running while you began your, um, you know, focus on your research? Well, actually, I retired in 2011. It was the, the last year of my PhD, and I couldn't keep up the pace. I couldn't work hard enough to get all my studies done, and I couldn't train properly. Or if actually I was lacking of resting as well. So at some stage, I was feeling that I was overtraining because I wasn't resting enough. So that's why I decided that if I wanted to be a successful researcher I had to to decide so that's why I stopped running at high level and just like a few weeks after I retired I went to South Africa for my postdoc so more or less everything everything explains why I stopped. Mm -hmm. And do you still run now kind of recreationally or was it completely you just wanted to focus on your work? I have tried a couple of times to come back but I am too competitive so it's, it's simply not possible. I, I remember like last year, my, uh, my father-in-law bet me to, to win a race in his hometown. And I trained for a couple of months, like really, really hard. And I actually won the race. <laughs> but I realized that I can't run for fun. I, just, I only can run for, for performance. So at the moment, I don't have time enough to train that way. So that's why I, I simply don't run. I hit the gym every once in a while. I do climbing and stuff. But I don't run anymore. So maybe you'll come back as a super masters runner one day and we'll see you breaking world records in the in the masters championships. But that's actually my fear as well when I decide to stop competitive running that I'm not going to be able to run for fun. So hopefully I can I can do it. But I, I have that same fear as you. All right. And then so you you did your PhD um, and, uh, you know, we're going to go on to some of the research studies you've done. 
Um, but did you always know that you wanted to do a focus on running or was it just something that kind of caught your eye um, while you were running at the time? Well, not, not really, because I just started my degree in biology because I loved, uh, you know, uh, animals and nature and stuff. So at the beginning, my goal was to work on something related to wildlife. But it was my second year at the university when one of the subjects was uh, human physiology. And I had like an epiphany or something like that, you know, because concepts like VO2 max, lactic threshold, brain economy, all these concepts started to make sense for me. And I was running at a pretty de- at a pretty decent level that time. And that's when I decided that I wanted to be an exercise physiologist myself in the future. So more or less, everything happened. Yeah, it, it was like 2006, more or less. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And and was it um, you think that because running was on your mind because you were trying to still achieve some great things that it was kind of in there or was it something else? Well, that year I changed my my coach mm-hmm. and my coach was uh, a really a really smart guy that uses that still uses science as the base of his training and he was always talking about all these concepts. And I didn't understand them, but after studying this uh, human physiology subject, I started to 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 get a lot of interest in how my body worked, why I was uh, struggling at some speeds, or why um, VO2 max is an important concept to, to to train and stuff. So that's more or less why mm-hmm. why I changed my mind. Mm-hmm. And now he comes to you with uh, asking you questions about science. Right now, you're the uh, the expert here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he has a lot of experience, and there are some some factors that can be learned in a lab that can have to be seen on the track. But yeah, still, for some especially related to strength training and stuff, he asks asks me questions. So one day, you two will make a real power team for for some athlete to become a coach when you work together. <laughs> uh, I think that that will be too too hard because oh, I okay. I will be like really really demanding and stuff. So. You have to be a really focused guy to train with somebody like me. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And then when did uh, running economy come into this? You, you've done quite a lot of studies on, you know, um, being an economical runner. Um, when did that kind of come into this? Well, you know, uh, a lot of training nowadays is very focused on VO2 max exercise intensities or with lactic threshold intensities. And a lot of people forget how important efficiency is. And because of this lack of knowledge, as I as I said in 2006, more or less, is when I got interested in exercise physiology. Ex- uh, running economy it was it was not like well known. And everything started more or less in 2007 with a paper by Carl Foster and Alejandro Lucia, and they started pointing out the importance of running economy, and that's why I choose this exercise physiology parameter as a, my main. Uh, I'm a main topic of research. Mm -hmm. And are you yourself an economical runner? Well, I actually wasn't very economical (laughs) because I was, I was quite heavy actually for a, for a middle distance runner. I had a huge VO2 max. My values were clearly above 80 milliliters per kilo per min, which is quite high. And, And unfortunately my running economy was quite bad. But in 2011, I started doing some strength training based on speed. I started plyometric training and stuff, and my running economy actually improved a lot. And in my best year, actually, it was I was I was I wouldn't say that I was very efficient, but I was definitely more efficient than years before. Okay, and you said about you've mentioned a few times so far about strength training and how important that has been. So you mentioned plyometrics just there and a few other things. But what can people listening? Um, make sure to, you know, put this, why should they put it as a focus um, in the future of their training if they want to run their best? Well, one of the main problems actually, especially for recreational runners, is that a lot of them don't do any strength training at all. And that's a big mistake, I think. A lot of research has shown that strength training is a key it's a key training to improve your 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 performance, your running economy, to reduce risk of injury and stuff. So I don't know why people don't don't hit the gym mm-hmm. when they are prof- even professional runners have a lot of lack of knowledge with regards to strength training. And I don't know why this happens because research is very clear. Mm-hmm. Almost every single study that has focused on strength training has found that 
this kind of training improves your performance, improves the running economy. But I guess that this is something that researchers have to have to change, try to send this message to the coaches to yep. include strength training into the training programs of the athletes. And they will see that the benefits are huge. So it's actually worth it to, to try. And what kind of strength training are we talking about here? Are you talking about heavy lifting? Are you talking about using dumbbells? Does it matter? Well, uh, it depends on the level of the athletes, obviously. But uh, basic exercises like deadlift, uh, squats, uh, even bench press, all these kinds of exercises are, are important. Uh, I would recommend to use uh, heavy workloads rather than light ones. Uh, try to to lift at high speeds. Try to base your strength training on speed rather than on the weight and stuff. And of course, uh, plyometric training is important as well. Even heels is a form of strength training. So every every everyone does is, uh, does heels, but not everyone hits the gym to do like proper mm-hmm. strength training. And how often have you found to be the max uh, the optimal amount of time to go to the gym? Is it twice a week or i recently did a meta-analysis of every single study using strength training to improve running economy in elite runners and we found that every single study found an improvement in performance and running economy when doing a heavy workload strength training and according to that meta-analysis the most appropriate or the best uh, frequency of these kinds of training will be like twice or even three times per week depending on how good you are and how many sessions you do, but at least two, two times okay. a week. Great. And and even if someone isn't an elite runner, that's something that could kind of give them a bit of a, a motor, not a motivation, but bring them up to the next level for them if they added it in as well. Definitely, because stronger runners can actually train a little bit more. Uh, he will recover better from other sessions. Uh, his uh, hormone endocrine system will be better. So, There are many benefits and you don't have to train like really, really hard in the gym all the time. Obviously, there is a progression. If you're a recreational runner, you can start with simple exercises. And as soon as you start to improve, you can actually do like more complex exercises. Yeah, definitely. And uh, anyone listening will know that that's something that um, I have personally found huge success with in working with my strength coach, Drew Watts, who I actually have a previous podcast with um, episode 108. Uh, sorry, yeah, 108. So um, make sure you go check that out. And I will put a link in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC138. Okay, so Jordan, um, I wanted to kind of dive into the recent studies you've done. Um, and you have you seem to have done multiple studies on Kenyan runners and their performance. Um, so firstly, why was it, why was Kenyan runners, um, focusing on Kenyan runners, the um, area you decided to go in? Well, because I did my PhD trying to compare the physiological differences between North African runners and European runners. And while I was doing that, I saw that almost every single research done in African runners was from a single group from South Africa. This group was led by Tim Noakes. Mm-hmm. So I contacted Tim and I told him that I wanted to learn from him. So in 2011, I did a research stay with him of three months. And actually, he liked the way I worked. So he invited me to do a postdoc. Uh, because he has funding and he wanted to conduct a research study on Kenyan runners. So everything started that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so most of the studies you have done have been with that same group? Yeah, exactly. We tested 15 elite Kenyan runners. Well, elite. Uh, they are elite for our standards. Maybe in Kenya they were not the best ones. Their main or their average times were around 62 minutes for a half marathon, which is quite impressive. But maybe in Kenya it's just average, you know. And yeah, we tested almost everything that can be tested in a in a lab. We tested their biomechanics, their neuromuscular activity, their brain oxygenation, their bone density, early life factors, genetics. So we tested everything and we are slowly, step by step, publishing every single result that mm-hmm. we got. And can you share some of those findings that you had with us? Well, Maybe one of the most interesting studies was the one on their brain oxygenation because we found for the first time that they can keep their brain oxygenation within an stable range. 
And this is quite surprising because everybody else has a drop in their brain oxygenation when you are reaching exhaustion. And it is believed that this drop in brain oxygenation somehow affects performance, muscle recruitment and stuff. And if this doesn't happen in, in Kenyan runners, we can see that as an advantage. We try to explain this because of their early life factors, because they are born and raised at high altitude and they do a lot of physical activity during childhood and all these, far, all these factors actually somehow affect or improve your brain vascularization. That's why maybe they have this better brain oxygenation. So that study was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology and it was a huge success. Uh, we have done other research studies trying to to see why they are so economical. So we we have compared uh, biomechanical parameters such as stride length, stride frequency, ground contact times, flight times, to see whether they can influence the running economy. And actually we think that maybe their short ground contact times somehow explain their, their great running economy because their, their ground contact times are around 10% shorter than for any other runner of the same level or at least close to their level and the running economy is around nine percent uh, better as well so we think that there is some kind of relationship between these specific biomechanical parameters and the amazing efficiency mm -hmm. and uh the so you just said about the ground contact time um being much shorter so just for people so we're trying to like visualize this this means that when they land, um, they are able to kind of push off quicker than the, the majority of us. Maybe is that anything to do with, you know, heel striking or toe off or what What could come into that? Well, uh, the ground contact time uh, has like three sub phases. One will be like initial contact. The next one will be a stance phase. And the last one, the propulsive sub phase, when we apply force to move forward. Uh, when your ground contact time is shorter, actually you lose less speed during that specific ground contact time. And therefore you don't have to use that much energy during the propulsive surface to keep the speed. And that's why, that's why we think that they are so economical. Maybe because their braking phase during this ground contact time is, is shorter, therefore their speed loss is lower and therefore they have to apply less force to, to keep up the speed. Uh, this has been reported previously as well in, in other runners and nowadays researchers more or less agree in that shorter ground contact times are better for running economy. And actually you have or you can improve your ground contact times by, for example, doing pleometric training, by improving your stiffness and all these things. In the case of Kenyan runners, they do, they do it naturally, but we can actually somehow imitate this by doing proper strength training. Okay, great. That was exactly what I was going to ask. So once again, this comes back to the strength training aspect and how important that is um, in the, you know, if, like you said, they can do it naturally, but we can, we can teach ourselves to do it. And did you have any theories on, on why they would naturally be more efficient in that way? Like, was it you know, we hit, we often hear stories about, you know, the, um, you know, African runners run to school and run back. And so they just get used to running. And, you know, is it is it something like that? Or do you not have no idea why they could possibly um, have that, you know, running economy um, naturally? Well, the, the Kenyan running phenomenon actually is multifactorial. So it's not only one factor that that explains their amazing performance. I have said that they have a, an, an amazing brain oxygenation, for example. That's mm -hmm. one factor. They are economical. That's another factor. Obviously, they train and live at high altitudes. Another factor. The diet is special. They have huge motivation. They have a special anthropometrics. They have a special biomechanics. So many factors actually explain why they are so good. Mm -hmm. Not only one can explain everything. In the case of uh, the amazing running economy, one Japanese research team actually found that they are better at hopping, that their ten mm. Achilles tendon stiffness is better, mm. that their Achilles tendons are longer. So that's something that we can't imitate because if you have uh, an Achilles tendon of a third times length, that's what it is. You can change that, but you can actually improve your stiffness or maybe you can actually lose weight or maybe you can actually try to eat a bit better or you can actually try to train a bit more or try to improve your motivation or try to 
You know, there are a lot of factors that can be imitated and there are many others that are genetics mm -hmm. and can't be, can't be imitated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned all of those factors, some of which we can control, some of which we can't. Um, and I was just wondering when you mentioned about the, you know, the better oxygenation and, um, you know, their diet and things, do you kind of see a lot more people maybe moving to Kenya? Like maybe, you know, let's say you have two runners who are running at a high level and they want to have a kid. Like, would you see people moving to Kenya for that reason to kind of have their child be born there or, you know, train there more? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, actually, I think that uh, maybe the only way to, to defeat Kenyans in the future is to invest money and to send buses to Kenya. So they, they have to, to use the buses and not run to the school because obviously all these early life factors <laughs> such as running since a young age or being born and raised at high altitudes play an important role, not only for, for the brain oxygenation, but for many other physiological characteristics. So if we want to control that, yeah, one, one option is to go to Kenya and try to live like them. There are a couple of Western athletes uh, from New Zealand, the Robertson brothers that have been in Kenya and Ethiopia for like 10 years, something like that. And they are nowadays some of the best white runners in the world. So actually that, that can help, but you can do that when you are an adult because the most important years are the young ones. And if you don't do physical activity when you are a kid, some of the adaptations that they have, you will never be able to get them. So... What can you do to imitate that? Well, in Europe, like 14 years ago, I mean, 1440 or 50 years ago, people used to do a lot of exercise. Mm -hmm. And at least in Europe, there were many, many athletes in those years that were even faster than the best athletes nowadays. So what has happened here? If our training is better, if our diet is better, if we take supplements and we have physios and all these runners, like back in the day, didn't have everything and they were still as fast as us. But maybe because they they have another philosophy of running, maybe because they were very active kids when they were younger. So I don't know, maybe the key and the answer lies there. Mm -hmm. So for anyone listening who has a um, who has young children, uh, keep them keep them active if you want any hope of them be becoming successful in the future. <laughs> um, and then. Do you see, I mean, this is just me thinking while we're, while we're talking, do you see um, with the way things are moving towards, you know, genetic modification and the way people are kind of changing, uh, you know, we, we often joke about, you know, um, designing babies and things like that. Do you see this some, being something that people would want to work on with like genetic wise to kind of give us that longer Achilles tendon or to give us different things? Well, uh, that's what I call genetic doping. And actually, <laughs> I, I work for the Spanish anti-doping agency as well, try, uh, researching like biological passports and stuff. And genetic doping is a big concern because it's, it's actually possible to do that. Uh, there are certain research studies on, on mice and on, on monkeys using EPO genes, uh, EPO gene enhancers, uh, using myostatin blockers and stuff, and the results are scary because the the the, me, the the monkeys and the rats actually improve their performance a lot using these genetic modifications. So actually, that's that's possible from a technical point of view, but obviously with humans, it's a bit more complicated because the ethics committees that control research don't allow us to to do that. However, certain genetic therapies can be used to to treat specific diseases like muscle dystrophies and stuff. And if we can use that technology initially designed to improve the lifestyle of people suffering for uh, muscle dystrophy, maybe it will be a form of genetic doping, which is quite hard to detect actually. So it's a big concern and I, I fear that in the future it will be a problem as big as it's doping today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And wow, that's, that's fascinating. And just uh, kind of, like you said, a little bit scary. And, and actually, I, I did not know that about you with the, um, you know, the, the doping, um, working with anti doping. So then if you don't mind me asking, um, what would you, because there's been a lot of scandal lately with some of the Kenyan runners coming over to the US and doping or, you know, using in the, um, using EPO in the 
championships and they've not a lot of people haven't been caught but there's this whole uproar of is our sport in jeopardy have you seen that that as you've been kind of from both sides of things you've been there with the Kenyan runners and you've you're obviously working against doping with with the Spanish team so what have your experience been with that? Well, first of all, uh, yeah, Kenya has a doping problem, at least from a technical point of view, because they don't have a certified lab in, in Kenya. They are trying to, to get one now. There have been many doping cases in Kenya lately. However, I have to admit that most of them were not with very strong substances. They weren't using EPO or steroids. They were using mainly stimulants and things like that. But even though it's, it's, it's a problem. However, I will say that uh, Kenyan Kenyan phenomenon can't be explained by doping because the deep of their of their performance they have so many good runners that is is just dumb to think that all of them are doping. I for example in the case of the runners I re- I tested were absolutely average. They were people with very low incomes and they were still amazing. They can't afford using doping and they were still really really fast. So. There are Kenyans that are using doping. Surely, yes. Mm, every one of them uh, is using doping. Definitely not. I, I really think that the Kenyan running phenomenon is real. I really think that. But obviously, there are always dirty apples everywhere. And in this case, uh, the only thing we can do against cheaters is just to get really longer bands. Two years, maybe it's not enough. Maybe life bans will be the solution or maybe economical uh, sanctions or something like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And very, very interesting that you've been able to kind of see this from both sides of things. And and yeah, I agree. I mean, there is just just too many factors going into this. It can't just be, you know, a blanket statement here. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Okay, so one other thing I wanted to ask you about um, related to these studies you did um, in recent years with the running economy was, um, you know, we're often told we need to have this cadence of 180. Um, and I just wondered what, what, based on your research, you have found. Well, uh, that statement or that advice is based on a book by Jack Daniels, which is a very famous coach there in the United States. And it's based on results from the from the Olympic Games in Los Angeles in 1984. And basically, it's the average uh, stride frequency of, of runners from different events, from the 800 meters to the marathon. So that's why it's, it's grown from the beginning. Why? Because a stride frequency, or cadence, as you, as you call it, uh, changes with the speed and changes with, with the different anthropometrics of every runner. Why? Because if you are running at, let's say, five minutes per kilometer, and your stride frequency is, I don't know, let's say 160 steps per, per minute. As soon as you start running a bit faster, let's say to three minutes per kilometer, which is, which is much faster, the only way to achieve that faster speed is by either increasing your stride length or your cadence or both. So even for the same runner, he will have a different stride frequency depending on which speed he's running. Therefore, trying to use a single number for everyone, for any speed, without taking into account the pace, without taking into account whether he's tall or short, without taking into account whether he's uh, rested or not, is is ridiculous. In our study with Kenyan runners, we saw that the majority of them had lower stride frequencies than 180, and that these uh, stride uh, frequencies change with the speed. So... Like how we much have would to it change? Individualize. Like around ten percent, something like that, maybe. They, we tested them at uh, twelve kilometers an hour, which is five minutes per kilometer, and at twenty kilometers an hour, which is three minutes per kilometer. And the stride length and the stride frequency were different, obviously, at different speeds. So why should we advise people to run at an, a specific cadence when this cadence has to change with the speed, has to change? Even in elite runners like these Kenyans, none of them has uh, 180 steps per minute cadence. No one. Some of them has uh, higher or lower. Depends. Uh, actually, people select unconsciously the best stride frequency for them. So you can change that with training. You can change that 
doing running technique exercises, but if you try to change your running cadence consciously, your running economy will will be worse. So your performance will be worse. Any change in your biomechanics has to be unconscious. Has to be because you are stronger or because you are more flexible or for whatever reason. But if you do it consciously, your performance and your running economy will be worse. And this has been shown in many, many studies. So I don't know why people still recommend this 180 steps per se, uh, per minute uh, stride frequency. I don't okay. know why. Well, very, very in- interesting and, and definitely going to shock quite a few people listening, but so important. And uh, and, and yeah, you're, you're right there. And um, so you, you haven't found that, you know, um, for maybe a... Uh, 1500 meter runner um they would need you know a higher frequency and maybe a marathoner because you're going to hold it for multiple hours would need a uh, lower fr- like did you find anything between the distances um well the difference here is the is obviously the speed mm-hmm. but when you are running 1500 meters the speed is not the same if you are running a marathon obviously mm-hmm. so this will somehow affect your stride frequency and your stride length Obviously, middle distance runners have longer strides and and also higher stride frequencies because of the speed of the event. So that's why we have to inv- individualize the perfect stride for each person and for each event. Okay. And so what you're saying is you should kind of, you know what that is yourself. It'll just be what feels most natural and not try and force it. I'm just thinking about, you know, let's say you're running with your training partner and uh, you're training for a marathon and they have this real marathon shuffle going on, you know, very quick steps. And you are taking, you know, maybe what feels like double the amount of steps they or sorry, half the amount of steps they are. You shouldn't try and say, oh, well, they must be more efficient than me. I need to run that way. You should just stick with what feels most comfortable for you. Exactly. If you try to change your biomechanics to, to run like your running partner, because he's better than you or something like that, your performance and your and your efficiency will be worse. So if you want to run differently, maybe you should hit the gym, try to do running technique exercises, maybe try to improve your stiffness, or maybe try to improve your flexibility to have longer strides, I don't know. But as soon as you try to do all these changes consciously, it will be a bad decision for you, definitely bad. Every study actually shows that not only your running economy, but also your performance gets worse. So oh, the, the only advice I can give you that if you are running comfortably at a certain stride length or at a certain stride frequency, is because your body is more efficient at that specific uh, stride frequency or, or stride length. So keep keep it that way. Okay, fascinating, great. Um, and uh, there was one other question. I was, oh, um, one more thing is, um, what about uh, striking? I know this is something that people are very interested in. Uh, does it matter if you land on your heel or if you ma- land on your midfoot? Or what have you found? Well, uh, here I have to recall a study that was published last year, I think, by another Spanish researcher, which is called Ana Guetta, And she found that rear foot strikers are more economical than, than four foot strikers. And for me, this is quite surprising because most of the best runners in the world are four foot strikers and not rear foot strikers. We have done some research on this specific topic as well, and we have found the opposite, that the most economical ones are the ones that land on their forefoot. And I really think that it's more efficient and that for elite runners, it's important to be forefoot striker and not heelfoot striker. But you can see there is a very interesting picture. I found it on Twitter. I think that Steve Magnus uh, tweeted it, where you can see the striking of every single guy at the American trials on the 10,000 meters, I think. And you can see there Galen Rapp, a perfect four-foot striker, and you can see many others with different strikes. So which one is the most efficient or the best one? It depends. In that picture, you can see how different styles can be adapted by, by elite runners. So even if, in my opinion, I think that four-foot striking is the best one, you will see elite runners using different strike patterns. So it's hard to say, even more when different studies show different results. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I will put a link to that picture in the show notes for everyone to see. But 
Um, so then how does that relate to you said about trying not to change your, you know, cadence, but or your stride frequency, but is heel striking to forefoot striking something you can change? Or is that again, something that you're kind of stuck with? Well, uh, it has, it can be changed, but some people can actually change their striking pattern. Some others cannot. For example, by using a barefoot running approach, maybe you can change your heel strike into forefoot striking because obviously when running barefoot, it's actually painful to run doing heel strike. But not everyone can do this switch because if you actually can't do the switch and you still run barefoot or with minimalist shoes, you can actually get a, a bad injury like a stress fracture or something like that. But a lot of people actually can do the, the switch. So it's not for everyone. But it's something that can be worked on, okay. definitely. Okay, so maybe anyone listening, if you want to kind of, you know, maybe try some barefoot running or try to see how it feels slowly, don't, you know, jump into a 12-mile a long run suddenly running on your toes when you've always been a hill striker. But, um, you know, s- s- play around with it, see if it works for you. And if it, after a little while, feels unnatural, just go back to what you're doing is yeah, that what you're saying? there are actually really interesting studies on this specific topic by dr nicholas town from south africa he did his phd on barefoot running and he found that some people are responders to barefoot running and can benefit from this uh, this transition and some people are not non-responders so they will actually uh, don't benefit from barefoot running so that's why you have to know whether you are responder or non-responder and how long can people give to kind of find out? Well, uh, Dr. Tam, for his research, did an eight weeks uh, progressive barefoot running program. Yes, he, he, I remember because I was a research participant actually. <laughs> and everything started like with five minutes of barefoot running, five minutes walking, five minutes of barefoot running. And progressively over eight weeks, at the end, you should be able to run 40 minutes barefoot. And as I say, some people adapted to that and some didn't. And the ones that were not responders were actually increasing their res- risk of injury. So that's why we should be very careful when giving this advice, because some people actually won't benefit from it. Okay, great. Thank you. I will put a link in the show notes. And as we have mentioned, a lot of different studies, um, it's again at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC138. All right. Um, so, you know, you've, you've, we've talked about a lot of studies today and you've had some publications in some really big, um, well, some you published in some big publications. Um, and uh, how did that feel for you as a researcher? Did you ever kind of dream that you would end up, you know, with all these studies next to your name? Or was that something that um, once you started studying, you kind of always dreamed of? Well, when I look back, I remember that it was difficult to imagine that I will have achieved the, the publications I have achieved now. Because at the beginning, I remember that my first paper was rejected like eight times. And, mm-hmm. and that's why maybe I aimed too high at the beginning. And now, more or less, I know where my studies can fit. But yeah, I have been lucky enough to publish in Journal of Applied Physiology, Journal of Sports Sciences, International Journal of Sports Medicine, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, I have published as well in International Journal of Sport Physiology and Performance. And I think that I have been able to publish in all these journals because of, of the people I have worked with. People like Tim Noakes, Ross Tucker, uh, Nicholas Tam, all these guys that are top leaders in their fields. And they're actually native English speakers, so they help me a lot with my <laughs> writing. And, and yeah, hopefully in the future, I will try to improve my publication record as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm excited to see where you kind of go. And, and what do you see as the future? Where are you going next with your research? Well, at the moment, we have a very interesting study, uh, which is, uh, is, is uh, how can I say, we will try to, to develop a heart rate monitor that will be able to predict your lactate threshold. Mm, uh, wow. We are working with artificial intelligence and... And we are working together with a high-tech company. And hopefully in a few years, this heart rate monitor will be in the market with a strong science behind it. So that's what we are working on at the moment. Yeah, wow, fascinating. And I can't wait to kind of keep up with that. And uh, what is the best way for people to follow you if they do want to kind of keep up to date with this? 
Well, uh, they can follow me on Twitter, Twitter. which is at Jordan Sudafrica, or or maybe in or maybe in Facebook. However, in Twitter, I tweet in both Spanish and English, and all my research uh, studies, all my conferences, congresses, everything will be there. So, if okay. they want to follow my work, they can do that. Okay, great. On Twitter. I will put a link in the show notes. All right, Jordan, I'm just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and then we will be right back with the final kick round. Okay. Thanks to Body Health for sponsoring this podcast. So what is Body Health, you ask? Well, as you probably know, the food and supplement industry is kind of corrupt and it can be so overwhelming to find products that will not cause us to grow an extra arm in 10 years. I'm joking, of course, but you know what I mean, right? It's hard to know who to trust. Well, I can give you one company who can be trusted, and that's Body Health. Their products are not only going to help you recover and therefore improve as a runner, but their motto of optimizing health and vitality is what they truly believe in. I take 5 to 10 of their perfect amino tablets every single day, and it's made a huge difference to my recovery time. If you don't believe me, listen to this. Your body can only absorb and use 18% of the protein in whey and soy protein, and only 48% in X but our bodies can use 99% of the protein in Perfect Amino. Impressive, right? You can enter to win a pack of six bottles by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health, or you can get 10% off using coupon code TINA10. Thank you to Socony for sponsoring this podcast. Socony is the favorite brand of runners everywhere. Now, I might be a little biased, but I absolutely love their running apparel, accessories, and of course, shoes. I've been running in Saucony for almost three years, and I love the brand like a friend. They don't just make fun clothes and shoes in beautiful colours, or cool colours for my male listeners, but this is a brand that actually cares about us as runners, not lumping us in with other sports. Saucony truly puts the time and effort into thinking what we actually want and need, and to me, that means a lot. My favourite shoes are the Saucony Ride for training runs and the Saucony Fast Twitch for workouts and races. And I've also been trying out the new Freedom ISO they have coming out in December. It's been getting a lot of buzz, and I can definitely see why. They're awesome. Get 10% off at Saucony.com by using coupon code TINA. Just don't get mad at me if you can't stop buying things on the website. I know I want it all, and I'm sure you will too. All right, Jordan, just five little questions for you, starting with uh, the greatest advice you've ever received. Well, maybe the most important one was from my coach. And he once told me that you shouldn't train more if you can't rest more. Mm. So this is a very important advice. And people shouldn't train harder if they can get enough sleep or enough resting. Mm -hmm. Train smarter, not harder. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Okay, uh, favorite running book or blog? Well, uh, I have to to mention here Sweat Science from Alex Hutchinson. It's a blog from Runner's World and he... He's always explaining in very plain language the latest studies on running. And he has a great taste because he has featured like three or four of my studies. Yeah, there. I was just going to say, was that the reason <laughs> you chose him? Because he's uh, it's a It's a great blur, yeah. <laughs> and I have to mention two books as well. Uh, one is Science of Running, How to Find Your Limit and Train to Maximize Your Performance by Steve Magnus. Yep. I follow this, this guy on Twitter and he's always giving really good advice. Yep for runners of any level. So he's a must follow. Mm-hmm. And of course, I have to I have to mention the Bible, the Bible of my supervisor, Tim Knox, yeah. Lord of Running. Mm-hmm. Even if he's working at the moment, I think, in a new edition, and he will change completely the nutrition part, the, the old editions are still really good. And anyone interested in running should read this, this, this book. It's oh, really yeah. great. Yep, Tim is definitely one of the scientists of our time and uh, we have had him on the show, so I'll put links in the show notes to those books and Tim's interview. Um, All right, what was your pre-race meal? Well, rice or pasta with tuna, a very light meal. Hmm. Yeah, with tuna and a banana and a yogurt. Very good. That's my pre-race meal. Yep, great, thank you. And finally, your favourite running product? I will say that lightweight racing shoes, for okay. example, Adidas Adicero Hagio, for example. What was, the, it was Adidas? the ones I used? Adidas Adicero Hagio. Oh, Adicero. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. All right. Great. And I'll put those in the show notes. All right. Uh, Dr. Jordan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was absolutely incredible with the information you've shared with us. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you're up to moving forward. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a real pleasure to be here. Well, what did I tell you? <laughs> Wasn't that a show-stopping episode? And I always forget just how much I love those science-based episodes until I do them, and then I just want more, more, more. He blew away so much of the advice that we hear over and over again, and I look forward to following his future research because who knows what he's going to find, and let's just hope genetic doping does not become a reality. Can you imagine what our sport world would look like if that did happen? I don't even want to think about it, so I'm just going to move on. Now, this is just a few days before Christmas, and I was hoping you would give me a little extra gift by giving the podcast a review on iTunes or through the app you listen to this podcast. And I'd really, really appreciate it. And I will put links in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC138 to show you how. But of course, you taking the time to tune in is the main gift to me. And so don't feel pressure to. I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for tuning in every week. Next week, we are going to be chatting to Jared Ward. And let me just say, this guy has so much advice. And even though we aren't Olympians ourselves, we can take and use his advice in our own running lives. He's so humble, so relatable, and he's known as the king of pacing. So if you struggle with pacing during your races, this is going to be a big one for you. So whether you are celebrating Christmas, Hanukkah, Omisoka, St. Lucia Day, Kwanzaa, Idal Fitter, Yule, Winter Solstice, or any other holiday, and I'm sorry if I missed anything or mispronounced anything, I hope you have a wonderful time with your family and friends this week. Happy holidays from everyone at Runners Connect and I hope you have a great week.